I guess we got to get started here. I was going to start off, I'm just going to cover the, these are the books that I use. This is my first one I got. And it's building beautiful boxes with the bandsaw. And there's a second version of it here of what they did later. It's the same person. This one has some of the basics in it, but it really gets more elaborate. You know, I haven't really tried any out of here. They're, they're the same thing. Once you learn the theory of how to do one, you can do the other ones. And they do sell both of them here. And uh, there's, it shows in here the different patterns, the ones that they've made, and different ones that you can try ideas if you want to get involved in that. And what I'm going to do is a pretty simple box. You know, I, it has the same theory. Once you can do one, you'll be able to do them all. There's um, the way you have to cut them on the inside and everything. It gives you actual diagrams in here. And I'll go over that in a little bit of where you have to start to cut, come around, and do your other cuts. And some are real elaborate where you're going back and forth, back and forth. And that's not what I'm going to attempt in front of all these people today. I'm, I'm happy to get one good cut out of it. Mm -hmm. So the one I'm going to do is going to have one drawer that you just have to make two cuts to get over there. Okay. I want to start off with um, <coughs> talking about, you know, the way that they had it set up about the tools, you know, that you need to make this. It's a really elaborate, uh, as far as the amount of steps. And then as far as the tools, they give you three pages listing on here of tools that you will need to do this. Mm -hmm. You know, with a little explanation of why you need uh, the table saw with a rip blade, a bandsaw rip fence, bandsaw uh, blade, belt sanders, and they go through the whole thing for three pages. And I got it down to like 12 items. You know, you don't need all these different things that they, they require in here. So it would be a fairly easy thing for you to do. Mainly you can need a bandsaw to make it easier, a spindle sander, and you know, at the station, something like this, you can do all the different parts. Uh, uh, my father was an avid bandsaw box maker, and he had a 36-inch bandsaw, direct drive, with a 16-inch blade on it, and that's what he used to make that totem pole out there, which is just full of drawers and secret compartments. And that totem pole was made out of a Cypress Railroad tie, so if you have not seen it and looked at it, you need to take a look at it. But he, he just literally made thousands and thousands of fence off our Okay, well, I guess I'll start off the. Um, I love making a bandsaw just for something to set up on the shelf. And I know a lot of people that make a lot of them. You know, I have friends online that have like six or seven in works all the time. And when I look at them, I, I don't see a lot of purpose on them. For, you know, they look pretty on the shelf. You know, you can put jewelry in it or whatever you want to do. You can make them whatever size you want. You know, for, I started off with one, I had a diagram of a small one, but I made it, you know, about this big just because I wanted something I could put more compartments in. Using the same compartments, you can only have with a few drawers, but make it big if you want to put bigger stuff in it. So you do what you want out of it, you know. So for, um, I want to start off by picking out the actual wood or selecting the wood that you use for this. You, if, uh, if you're using rough cut lumber, you want something about an inch thick and at least about five foot long. You know, any one of the patterns that are in this book, you can use um, 56 inches is the max that you would need for lumber for making this. You know, you take one board, you get the width of whatever it's going to be, depending on your pattern, and you actually cut that into five different boards, you know, so you end up with a thickness of a little, right around four inches or so. And so you can, you can plane it down and get to there. If you're using milled lumber, dry kiln, they want you to use dry kiln lumber more than anything. You don't have, a, if you just use a four inch block, which you can do that, but you still have a chance of it checking and cracking later, whereas using the dimensional lumber and gluing it up, you know, you'll have your choice of, you know, trying to keep it from going bad in the, in the end there. So. Um, Bob was actually going to glue up these things for me while we're doing this. But I was going to show you when I cut these things, this was some of the wood that we got from uh, Hardwoods Incorporated. And it was warped pretty bad. So I numbered them up. What I did was I, after I got done here, I put them together. And I don't like these and they didn't fit together. And these didn't fit together. So I kept switching them around. Now I got something to make a pretty tight fit. So if we glue it up just like this, we'll be able to, uh, you know, make something out of it. 
And the book goes a long ways into telling you how to square the whole thing up, which doesn't make a lot of difference because when you're done, you're putting your pattern in the center. As long as you've got all these boards out and they're tight, you know, you're going to cut the thing out and the whole outside is going to go away anyway. You know, so I was going to skip the whole section on squaring up the boards. So when Bob gets back here, he can pour glue that and put the clamps on. And at the same time, I've already glued one up and give this the same purple heart. I tried to get Peachtree to give me two band saws, one with a resaw capability, one without the resaw capability. And they only had the one that we could use, so I couldn't resaw this, so I did this part at home. You know, on the back of itself, what you're gonna do is you're gonna put a pattern out front, and we're gonna start that next. And on the back side, you're gonna end up taking it off. And I'm gonna read step. We wanna do it like a cooking show so you can see the different parts, but I want you to see all the parts that we do with it. Let me start by. I use a 3M45 for the spray adhesive. Most people in here use 3M77. I wanna set that for a few minutes. Okay, when you're picking out the wood from here, if you're, um, there's something once you want to stay away from. Something like, uh, oh, <coughs> really hardwood, so hickory, uh, pecan, apple, or something like that. Because not only are you going to have to cut this, you're also going to have to do a lot of sanding on it. If the sand hickory down to the shape you want and smooth it out and everything would take you a long time. A lot of times what I'll try and do is I'll look for something that has sort of a grain to it that has different colors on, the, on here. As you're looking at it, as you're looking at the whole piece sideways. That way when you put it together, you'd end up with the same grain pattern on each board here as you put it over there. And it makes a nice looking uh, box. I really don't have any of the ones that I've got here, but I've got some that were like light and then they went to like a sap wood and you had different colors down there. So the whole box had a really nice color on the side and you had the same pattern on each one. You have to let this sit for a minute here. Now you resawed that both front and back rough? No. Just back? No. At this point, you wouldn't have resawed anything. Oh, okay. you know, I did that. I cut the back off it just for the purpose of, because I couldn't do it in here. Okay. But you could have done it uh, ahead of time, first step. After you glue it, the first thing you do, you have to remove the back either way. Because you want to be able to put that on, that's going to be a solid piece when you get done with it. Okay. So the first thing you want to do, you want to do, well, for selecting the pattern, like I said, it depends on how in depth you want to get on this thing. You know, if, um, if you can get the camera on here, I want to show you a couple of the simple patterns. No, 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 right here. Can you? Yeah, I got it. Okay. These are all numbered on here. You have a one here. On this one, all you're going to do is go in this one spot, do a circle around on here, and come out. That's all you're going to do. Now, this is after you cut the back off. That's why you have to remove the back before this stage. But then when you go for a harder pattern, one like this, I don't know if you can get into the, you see all the different numbers and stuff? Each one you have to stow in a certain direction, go to a certain point, sometimes you have to back off, and then you have to get over there. You, if you, I like on here, you stow over here one, you come all the way around here to here, and then it's two, you back up, and then you go back around the other way, you take that part out, then you turn the blade around and go another direction. So, depending on how elaborate you want to get on doing these, None of them are hard. All of them would have the same thing, it's just what time consuming, how many drawers you want to do. In each drawer, you're going to end up sanding and cutting the front off and the back in different steps, too. So, you have a lot of uh, different steps there you may not want to do when you're in a hurry. Well, I knew I wasn't going to do it in this class here. They're up? Yeah. What size blade do you normally use? 316. 316? On something like this, 316 <laughs> works fine. You don't want to, um, you're going to have to make it either that or shorter. 360 if you're making a smaller box where you're making a tighter cut, you would want to get it, you know, like an eighth inch, you know. I tried doing something like these. These work good on a scroll saw if you don't use the wood so thick. You know, it's the same as a scroll saw box exactly, you know. But 
10 tips for answers for how you use It is. Yeah. Now, that was a problem I ran into with, um, I, I went to our formal site down there and got some blades cut or made up for me. And they only put like five teeth per inch. And when I was cutting these things out, the thing was so aggressive, I had a real hard time. I was pushing it, and it push and go, push and go, push and go. I made this as my cutout for this. It's gonna be the same exact one, so I can use this as certain uh, examples and when we go farther on. But as I was cutting it, I couldn't make the turns. I've, it was a 3 16th blade, but as aggressive as it was, it wasn't able to turn enough to follow along the pattern that you're supposed to follow. So I ended up going wider than what I wanted. So what I did is I just widened the part on the outside. So those lines are just suggestions. Because <laughs> I wasn't close. <laughs> You have much luck with those eighth inch blades. I broke a lot of them. I didn't use eighth quit. inch. I, I've never made one that was any tighter. Well, I made them a lot tighter than this, but with a 316th, you can make a really tight turn on it. You know, and it isn't bad at all. You know, unfortunately with my saw, I use it for everything. So I use it for, you know, resawing and then I. I have to switch the blade to something else, and most of the time, whatever blade I got in there, it's the one I'm using. <laughs> so, <laughs> which biggest thing is to try to keep a smooth flow with it. Don't go back up, go back up. Otherwise, well, you're gonna be sanding your ass. Yeah, what I saw, on, <laughs> saw on those eighth-inch blades that, you know, the weld, it was, you know, the weld yeah. just wouldn't hold up on it. Yeah. And. It seems to work. I've never broke them on the island. I don't do it on today's carrying them, I think. <laughs> What's that? Uh, I was buying them at Highland Hardware, and I think they quit carrying them because I'd be back in there and say, the well failed again. Was that my cell phone? No. Maybe uh, somebody else. I can't remember now. A, well, a relatively well known. Rob, do you, do you ease the back of the blade? Can you ease the back? No. I had heard something. You know, there's all kinds of suggestions in a book on that, and everybody that's used a band so much, you know, you can put like a stone on the back of here and make it so you can cut a little sharper. But boy, the 316 blade, you can make all these turns without any problem. You don't have anything with that. You know, I had my grandkids over the other day when I glued up this block, and the first thing I did was the first one that I had on there, I drew a face on it. And I drew, you know, the eyebrows, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and everything. And I told my grandson that was, you know, that was him. And then I started doing the next one and said, who's this going to be? I said, never mind, I'm just putting glue on here. <laughs> Let me go ahead and uh, get this cut. I've never used this starter system on here. I know on my, on my um, saw itself, I've got the 18-inch jet. And for me to put this on here with the regular rollers and everything, I had a hard time keeping the blade in place with it being that far apart for cutting it in there. It kept wanting to come out of the slots here. Now this carter with the tension and everything's supposed to stop that and I shouldn't have any trouble with it. But that other aggressive blade really caused me a lot of problems, so I didn't go for 10 feet.
got to back it off here so I'm going to turn it off and then get the blade out of here. So now, different things to look at. Some woods, when you cut it off, when you get done with this, you're going to cut off and you have the drawer removed out of here. This is going to be the whole drawer assembly that you're going to take off the center. You have to worry about this part here. Uh, some of them it opens up so much that you have to use a clamp and glue it and put it back together when you when it dries. And some of them it wood tightens up so much you've got to cut a little slot out of the excess, open it up, and put it in there to keep it open enough to get the drawer back and forth. So, hey, Ron, you, yeah. Save those scraps for us. Okay. <laughs> I'll take them. I'll take them. You also see use your other scraps when you cut out the inside of the drawers. We're going to cut the front and back off. You have a center part that you have to take out of each one. You know that turners can make pins out of those. Your drawers going to end up like this, but you'll cut the front and back off. But you cut this inside out. You want to save that material because you're going to probably make a drawer pull to get them out of there. That's where you'll cut it out. You know that give you some excess to to use it with that.
there's no guide on the bottom of the table. You pull the guides on the top. You can do that. You can move the top and the bottom guide, and you just put the card on the top as you want to place it. At this stage, you could do different parts. You know, you've got to do several steps. You've got to sand it, sand the inside, the outside. You cut out the boxes and everything. At this time, I'm just going to cut this out so I get the resolved portion over with. And you should cut the back and stuff uh, at least a quarter inch to three eighths, so you got something to work with. I make it a little thicker. You know, I make it about three eighths on here. But when you're cutting out the drawers itself, if you look at the pattern on here. I'll, I'll go. If you look at the pattern out here, this is the part that they want you to have going in between the drawers, which it isn't that bad. It's, it's thin, not worry about breaking it off, but you're going to put a side on each side and glue it to there so you'll have support. I actually make mine a little wider. I go, you know, make it a little more than uh, probably about three eighths in between the <coughs> drawers. You know? But if you're making a smaller box, you wouldn't mind it. You didn't make the hole smaller, so you don't want to do too much of that. I, I noticed you put that fence up. How do you know it's square? I don't. You don't. No, it's yeah. not important. Yeah. No, it, it is a. It's not all that important because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this thing after I'm done. I'm going to put it on top of the here to smooth it out and everything to put it on anyway. You know, and, and even if you don't sand it, you know, on the, the back of stuff here, the, the front they're all going to go on there anyway. You know, it's not going to make a difference when you're done because. Uh, so you sand where you for the back. You sand. You, on both sides of that cut? No. Using it cut. no, no, I, I sort of mistook on that because what, what I did, what, or misspoke, I, I cut the back and the front off. If you don't do anything with them, they're going to match up. Right. So, because when I did that one, the back of this thing, it, I don't know if you can see the curve in there, but I'm off on there. My bandsaw tracked and the blade started pulling over as I was going through. So I wasn't perfectly straight. But once you once you glue it in, can you see, I don't think you can see the curve on there. Pretty much. Okay. But when I'm done, I'm just going to glue it together so I make sure I didn't put this on a sander, put these on there because you don't want to make it there. I, I do take some off of here. I do sand more often. I'll show you why in a little bit. So Rob, is that whole piece right there the drawer? The whole thing's going to be the drawer. So now you're cutting the back of the drawer off. Yeah, I'm going to cut off the back and the front, a slice off of each one, and then I'm going to put this pattern here. I've got an extra one I'm going to spray and put on here to cut out the drawers on here. Now you can freehand that, but uh, I'm, I'm, you're not going to put a pattern on it. Now, now Rob, you put, I know this is only a single drawer or whatever, but sometimes I, you put pencil marks or something on the top so they go back exactly like he's saying, because sometimes if you get drawers that are the same, you know, they look the same. You know, they're square, or they're round, they're not funky shapes. You might not be able to get that back on right. So you put a little pencil line between the. Between I just keep them together with each other. Okay. You know, I did have some that have like four drawers on it, and they are pretty close. As long as you glue it on there, by the time when you get ready to glue it, you make sure it fits and then put it on there. I check was in the back because to make sure that I had the clearance on here, you know, to, to cut that off. You know, what I do is I put it over there, I lower this down so you got the blade guard mainly covered. And uh, again, my grandson was over there for a Cub Scout thing the other day and he had to look at certain tools, so I showed him how to use a bandsaw. And the first thing I showed him was you put the wooden back and you lower this down and then you got the guard on there so you can't get your fingers too much in the way when you're cutting. And then every time I go to cut something all day long, he reminded me because normally I don't check it in the back like that. I just look at it and say, yeah, that's clear. And I had to go put it over there to keep up the music.
tendency to want to curve to the right. You know, even when I was trying to go straight with it without having to guide it, I, th I thought the first one, it threw it off. And I thought it was doing that. I don't, I don't know if you can tell where it started going farther and farther. I thought it was doing it because of the, the brace on there, but it wasn't that. When I tried doing it just straight, it still wants to curve to that, so, well, so you gotta... Open it up and see how, how well it's tracking. It's tracking in the middle of the... It's in the middle. We looked at it ahead of time. Another thing we did do ahead of time was uh, put a square out here to make sure we were setting perfect so it would all fit in there, but you know, it just didn't want to cut that very well. But you know, I asked them, we tried to get another saw for resawing, and they didn't have one, that's why I cut those off ahead of time, but I thought I'd be able to cut that smooth without any problem, but we'll, we'll live with it. Okay. No, it, it doesn't, when you glue it on, we put it back, you, you won't see that part anyway. All right. So we're going to take the front and back off. This is going to be, so you just keep everything in place of where it is. That's going to be your front. Now I don't no longer have the parts where I'm going to put the drawer, so what I'm going to do is remove this, and I'm going to put a pattern on the front of here and make those drawers in there so I can see where they're at. I took take the original pattern, instead of having the whole front, I cut it off just the part that's going to be on the drawer itself. So when I spray and put it back on, I don't have the excess part on there ahead of time, so make it a little easier for me. What's the difference between a 45 and a 77? It's a third the price. <laughs> now, I'm not finding any difference. You know, I use it for all my fret work I do. I sprayed that thing six years ago with uh, 45 and it stayed out for six years, it didn't peel off. Now I was told that you're supposed to have longer uh, lasting time on when you put the 77. You put it on, it's more permanent than this is. I've never had a problem with it, and it's a third the price. Do you spray both surfaces? <clears throat> no, no I don't. I understand if you want yeah. it to stick better than you do. If I'm doing like a, a picture and I'm going to make it a puzzle and I want it to stay there forever, I have sprayed the back of the picture and the surface. But if I'm doing something like this that eventually I'm going to take off, I don't spray the surface. And uh, one thing a lot of people do when they do these, and I, d I don't, is they put the clear packing tape on it like George does for the intarsia, and uh, that way it comes off better. I actually just use... Yeah, blue tape works better. Uh, I, well, I don't use anything on it. I, I just put the regular, I put this right onto the wood and I use paint thinner and a brush. I get it on and get it wet and then wipe it off. The only thing is if you don't want to get the paint thinner in your wood, you wouldn't want to do it that way, but I've never had a problem with it. You know, just, uh, it doesn't hurt anything. Okay, now that I've got this on here, you can see the lines that you want to cut out, and again, those are just suggestions. The center part here, I don't like it being so thin, like I said, I'm going to cut a straight line down here, a straight line down here, and then I'm going to cut at an angle like this, you know, to get across. And that way I'm not trying to make a turn right here that sharp and go over there, because that's all waste work. Hey Rob, what was the reason for cutting off the back of the front? So you, yeah, yeah, so I cut out the middle without getting it gone. <laughs> well, but I'm saying, but I'm saying the reason is because, because you have a set blade and the blade is there. No, that's if you don't cut the front off of this. No, but I'm just saying, that's the only way you can, but I'm saying, if you had a scroll saw, you could drill, you, yeah, in that case, the same way, we got to do the same thing on scroll saw. That's the reason behind it. It yeah. allows you to cut that cavity out. Here. Right, I want to cut the cavity out without messing up the front of it. As opposed to breaking the point, the blade and re it. Right. <laughs> Well, you can always you use some sort of uh, force or bits and clear it out, but it, that's a lot of work. Okay. Now again, if you can see the line, I'm cutting on the inside of the line. I want a thicker part on the back and all the, all the parts out there. I don't need to board that thing to spray for this anyway.
I've got your spot compartment for the pockets here. I'm going to try taking this off right away while it's still fairly wet. That way I might not even bother using the paint thinner. on here we have the front and the back this here just so you can have two drawers and part two part oh the pull itself there's, there's different <coughs> Right. Now there's different things you can do for that pull. You can use that part on there, but what some people do, and to make it look a little nicer, you can put notches on here. You can take and cut a notch around like this, so you just put your th finger in there. I don't. In fact, that one brown one there has the same type of notch on there where you can get in instead of putting a handle on it. And also, if you want, you can take the back of your box on here and use a forcer bit and put a little hole in it and you just push it on here. And some people don't like to put the handles on. The handles, you're just going to glue it on. There's no way of really holding it. So it's kind of delicate. If you, you put it on and glue it, you're taking a chance of knocking them off eventually. Anyway, that's what our drawer is sort of going to look like when we're done. I'm going to sand on the front and back. You don't sand on here. You use a, a spindle sander. It makes it a lot easier for cleaning it up. And I'm not going to clean up a lot. A lot of what they do in the book, I think, is overkill. What they're telling you is to clean this up all the way, but you're going to put flocking on here. When you put it on, you're going to put the paste on and then put your stuff on. And even if you got bumps stuff on here, if it's fairly smooth, it's not going to show up. So you're not going to worry about that. I'm going to go ahead and sand this on a little bit on the, on the insides on both, and then on you know the outside of here. And like I said, in between here and here, especially with the cut I got, I, I don't want to sand it because I never get it to match. I actually got to where I don't sand the faces where they glue together because. Well, that's what I'm saying. I wouldn't. Yeah. I wouldn't do that. There is a part that I do. Better if you don't. When you. Uh, when you're cutting the drawer out here, the kerf itself, you're taking away so much off of here and here. Now when I get ready to put this inside the box, like let me go ahead and put the box out here just for to show you. the back pedal. Okay, when you stack all these things in here, and you cut it down, you can see how much you've taken away from there. It, it's sticking out a little bit. Let me put this straight in the back. I need more hands. Okay, <coughs> even when it's on here, you can see we're recessed on here some. And by the time you sand it and everything, it's not going to fit right. So what I've done in these things, when I get it down to a certain point, which you can see it better on here, you can see how much of a lip I've got on here. I take this and I put it on the thing and I sand it smooth. And it doesn't say anything in the book about doing that, and I've seen a lot of people, the drawer is actually recessed, which makes no sense. So anyway, when you get to this point, you can go ahead and uh, put it on there. So, I'm usually put a shim on the back side of the box. You can, but I people are gonna take it out and see it. You know, I don't want anything showing. It doesn't hurt anything. So what I'm gonna do from this point on here is I'm gonna use this box for the rest of the bit while that thing sits there. But you know, when I get ready to uh, sand it and stuff. Well, the more yeah. you sand on the uh, cleaning on the outside, and I call it down uh, If you the less you do, the better it's going. To, you don't have that space in there, is that right? Right. 
That's what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get rid of that gap that's in between there right. so they're all set flush. Yeah. Uh, your next step after cleaning it up, and I'll, I'll go ahead and do that with this one, being I've still got it glued, or I haven't glued it together yet. Just a little bit of cleanup. keep it smooth all the way and you can't get the whole thing on you know the belt here a lot of them that you do are, are wider than what this one is I normally make them a little bigger so you put it on here you've got to keep turning it go back and forth keep it moving to try to keep it there I called Peace Tree yesterday if they have one I told them I'll just buy it from you and that way I'll put it up there and they're no longer selling the ones that they had here but Sears is and I ordered one from there yesterday
close enough. Yeah. This is uh, 120. At the house, I use different grits or something, but I figured I wanted to put something on. It wasn't real aggressive, but it would still smooth it out enough. But anyway, that gets it close enough there, especially if you don't do the inside by mistake in the first one. Okay. Like I said, the spindle sander will help clean up the edges and stuff like that. This is a pretty small grid on there, and I'm just going to do it just to go over and smooth it out a little bit. I'm not going to do the whole thing on here because we're not going to glue this up today or this part. the idea. I'm not going to go, you know, we have such a small one on here, I don't want to use that to try and smooth out the edges on here. But I just want to show you how to do the different steps on there. If, um, when I do it, I go to like a 400 grit on the whole thing when I'm done with it. And I don't go any deeper than that. But it depends on what type of wood though. You might want to put more of a finish on it. But the next step is just, obviously, just to glue it together. And I'm not going to do that on this one, but I have this one already glued together. And uh, I was just going to show you how to do the inside of it, the, the flocking itself. You know, are most of you familiar with doing flocking? Okay. Probably like you said earlier, you really didn't have to sand that on the inside that smooth, right? Uh, no, because you're going to put, you're, you're putting the paste on for the flocking, the, the adhesive. And you put that thing on there, it really... You're putting a layer on, you're just impregnating it into there. Okay. Now, one thing I will do before I glue this up is I'm going to put this on here when I get home and I'll cut off a layer off of here so, it's, like I said, the, the drawers flush up. Where do you get the locking material? Uh, Woodcraft. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I, I thought this over here. I've got like a, a wine color that's like a purple, black, green, blue, different things. The only thing I don't have is a screwdriver. itself it tells you to take tape and you put all the way along the top of these along here you get the blue painters tape and you put it on all the edges that you have here that way you're not putting the stuff on it you can wipe it off but you know and I haven't found it to be any problem so I haven't bothered putting it on myself and another thing that they do is they put shellac on the inside of here that way it adheres this stuff adheres to it good I've never come up across a wood, even the grainier type of wood, that didn't just stick to perfect, so I don't bother with it. The certain steps I've alleviated because I didn't really see a use for it. Now, 
This is a uh, adhesive. Does that come with the flocking kit? It depends on how you buy it. You can buy them separate. In fact, most of them do come separate because you can run out of, like the powder, you run out of this long before here. You hardly use any of this, but you resave the powder enough, or the, the fibers, I mean. Okay, your, glue, your glue comes in the same colors as your flocking, too, so you can get a light flock and it doesn't show through. But you wouldn't use your 3M or something like that? No. No, it's got to be, it's almost like a, a tar. Or, it's sort of like, it feels like paint, but it's a, it's a real strong adhesive. It's colored. Match. I mean, unless you're like Rob, you only need one or two colors. You don't need now four colors. I actually have about four colors just because I like the variety. Oh, I know. Depending on the wood. You know, I, I actually bought black today because I was figuring I'm going to be doing on the purple heart. I figured that would look really good. This one you could use red or any of the colors. They have some bright colors, but most of them are like a rich wine color. Is, uh, the burgundy. What's your, what's your working time with that blue? You probably got 10, 15 minutes. And the only thing you want to do is you want to make sure when you start using the flocking part itself is to be consistent, do it all at one time. Because once you push this stuff in there, you can't put more of this down without having like a, a humping or something like that. You know, you start putting the fibers on. So I'll be done. What I'm going to do is just do one half of this. Being that the glue is colored, it's easy to, easy to see where you missed, too. That itself. Oh, yeah. You can tell. Every time if I've gone over here and I didn't get enough on it, you'll, you'll be able to see it through there. You know, it's, How long it's, does that stay tacky? About 10 minutes or so. So you would have time to do both sides if you wanted? Yeah. I normally do do both sides at one time, but I won't do two or three drawers. You know, if I'm, uh, I'll have the drawers all set up. In fact, if there's somebody else with you, you can have one guy paint the stuff on and hand it off to them and they can put the, the fibers in. Can you uh, put that fiber, the fiber into that flocker? Load your gun. Load the gun. Load the flocking gun. <laughs> I, I was refraining from them. But I knew that would come out. <laughs> Some reason I hate throwing them brushes away. You mean the disposable brushes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't clean? But I, I have no idea why. I have two boxes of these things, like here, you know, with like, I don't know, 25 in each one. And I use the same ones over and over and over again. I use it for putting on paint thinner. And then when I get done, uh, when I'm doing like this life behind bars, I took that and I put paint thinner to get the pattern off. And then on top of that, I'll clean that all off, and then I'll take the same brush, and I'll use it for putting uh, tongue oil, and then I'll clean it off so I can use this again. I, I've had some brushes I keep for three or four months, and then when I throw it away, it bothers me for some reason. <laughs> and I have like 40 of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. What this is, you've got the fine fibers in here, and this is mainly air when you pull it up. So when you push it in the end, the air pressure is going to put puffs of the stuff out, and it really put, goes out pretty good spray. You want to put a lot in and put a lot in there, and when you're done with it, you know, just take it and let it set for 24 hours, and you just tap it upside down, all the fibers will fall out, and then you put them back in your bag and start it over again. So you're really using like this much of it each time. I've had the same bag that we've put in here probably four or five years, you know. And too much out of it right now, but you can see when you put it in there, it's consistent. You know, you can see, oh, that's good. I'm going to wipe, wipe, wipe this off out of my hands and wipe it on my nose. Okay. Okay. But 
Anyway, you, it looks like you use little piles of it where it's thicker, but it's not. When you puff, put a puff in there, it actually, sort of like using an air gun, put a, impregnates it in there a little bit. It gets in there, but you got little piles of it. It looks like it's too thick, but it's not. You let it dry for 24 hours, and then you just tap that against something to get the fibers come back out of there, and it'll be consistent. The only thing I don't like about flocking is if you're not careful with it and somebody scratches it on the inside, you really can't get it to match and look nice and even. You can empty up a little spot on it and put some more of the sealant on or the adhesive and then put it on there, but it'll always show up. And, but once you put it on there, it seems good. I like it so much better than the felt, you know, because I've tried, like the, Mike was saying, I've tied the felt with the adhesive on the back that you peel it off, and you're always going to see little seams and stuff, and it's not easy to work with. This only takes a couple minutes, and it looks really nice. Yeah. Please don't touch the blocking because it'll, it'll come up on your hands, and it spreads everywhere. It's about like graphite. <laughs> Yeah, I want to look at a couple of notes that I sort of did talk about during there. Uh, they talk about rounding over the drawers. You know, once you cut that front face off, they want you to round over, like right where it's at, like there. Go ahead. What, what they want you to do is take that front part there where the, it's at there and round them over a little bit. But when I've done that before, I didn't like, it wasn't a clean cut in between the front and the back. So if you round it over and you round it over on the inside of the box, you know, you, you've got a shape like this instead of a nice clear cut. So I didn't like doing that. It was another thing that I don't do. And uh, let's see. I think we have pretty much covered everything. You know, um, at some points when you're doing the, the box itself, you end up using um, a regular sander. I cannot get this, even as, as hard as it is here, because there's no flex to it. If you've got a drum sander like George uses for the entires or something like that, it's easier to get your shapes and you do a better job with that. I use this for just doing the inside of the drawers, because I can't get at it with anything, you know, smooth enough to get it cleaned up. And like I said, you don't have to do it too much, but you know, I bought one just for the purpose of doing those drawers and found out after it really didn't need it too much. But it does a really good job for getting into the small areas because some of these patterns in here get really come to almost a point on the insides. And you know, I'm not sure if I can find one in here that's too sharp. Okay, when you get ones like this and you get down the inside of here, no, I'm sorry. When you get down in the area side here, you can't really get your anything in there except for a really thin uh, spindle sander. So I'll take that, you know, and just do it by hand as much as you can. You know. Okay. Actually, that's most of it. You know, at that point, you know. You're going to take this, which I haven't done on this one, but you're going to do this the same way as you're going to do the outside of the drawers. You want to take it, smooth it out and everything. Your back surface here, you've already cut it off, so you don't need to sand on here, like I did the one over there. Your front, you have no front, that's your actual drawer. So anyway, at this point you would go ahead and sand it here. Now you can see, get ready to sneeze here. <laughs> you can see the grain on the wood here. And you can see a little bit of a pattern, you know, where it's drifting off like that. If you can get that in a little darker, it really looks pretty nice when you're done. I, I did one that was out of um, well, walnut, and it had a little bit of a light and dark color, but it would make a streak in the whole thing so it would curve with it. You know, when you're putting the boards on there, you know, try to match them up so you get the nicest design. I've made them with different type of wood, uh, where the contrasting wood, where I put like two maple on the outside. You use five three quarter inch boards normally. So I put like two of uh, one type on the uh, on the front, two in the back, and something in the middle. And I've done them every other board, like the one there. You know, you, you pick out whatever pattern you want on it. And I think that's about it. You got any questions? Well, Go ahead. Normally, normally would you have, I know it's a demo, would you have not finished it, finished the, the, the box, and finished the drawer 
before you did the flocking? Okay. Yeah, you, okay. you can finish it want, totally. Okay. And I like the, the ones I've did here. Okay. Yeah, and I'm going to take these home and I'll finish them all the way up and get them all done to, before I do the flocking. No, but I'm saying, but you would, but I'm saying you'll put your finish on the outside and everything else, and the flocking is the last thing you'll do. That's what I do. Okay. Now, the book doesn't do that. The book does the flocking. And you know, you sand and get all right. The book does the flocking, and then you tape. They have you take the drawer, and well, I've got to run around it, but they have the, you tape the drawer before you put the shellac on. Then they have you take that tape off, put the flocking on with new tape, and then you get all done with that, and then they want you to tape the whole top of the thing off, and then do your coating after the flocking's done. You know, and it really depends on how you want to do it. You know, if you go out online, you know, like the one that Mike brought in, there's just thousands of these boxes out there for different things. You can do them in the shape of, you know, anything that you design yourself. Or I, I wouldn't go bother to design it myself because they've got like 40 of these or more inside this thing, and I'm not making that many of these. <laughs> you know? I, I probably made maybe uh, 15 or something like that. And I like making them. They're, they don't take long. You know, you saw how long it took to make this. Now this is without, you know, doing all the right sanding and you know doing the different steps. You know, it would have been a lot easier with having a resaw uh, blade inside of there to get it smooth. But you know, as something you just want to give away as a gift or something like that, you can make it and have it all ready. You know, working on your finish and everything, probably you know two hours at the most.